Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural event of the 2021-2022 Spotlight Series. I'm Matt Bribitzer Stahl, Director of the University Honors Program, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education, and Professor of Music Theory. The University of Minnesota Spotlight Series is a collaborative partnership between the Institute for Advanced Study, the University Honors Program, and Northrop to present lectures, panel discussions, exhibits, and other events throughout the academic year around timely topics of interest. The six-part 2021-22 series, hosted in partnership with the Minnesota Humanities Center, focuses on patriotism, public service, and civic engagement. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that whether you are here on campus with us or with us online, we are all located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge that this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. The IAS, Northrop, and UHP are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's three guests. Booker Hodges serves as Assistant Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Hodges joins DPS after serving as the Interim Chief of Police for the City of Prior Lake. His experience also includes time with the Minnesota State Fair Police and Dakota and Ramsey County Sheriff's Offices. Hodges also spent five years as president of the Minneapolis NAACP, becoming the first police officer to serve as branch president. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Northwestern in St. Paul. And yes, we will, we will applaud all speakers in a moment. Thank you. Georgia Fort is a two-time Emmy-nominated media producer and television correspondent who is changing the narrative through visual stories about race and culture that build equity. Born in Minnesota, she has over a decade of broadcast experience that spans from public radio government television to national commercial television broadcasting. Fort graduated from the University of St. Thomas, where she advocated for student, parents, and diversity and inclusion. Keith Ellison is Minnesota's 30th Attorney General. As the people's lawyer, Attorney General Ellison's job is to help Minnesotans afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. His guiding values are generosity and inclusion. Ellison represented Minnesota's fifth congressional district in the US House of Representatives. While in Congress, he founded the Congressional Antitrust Caucus and the Congressional Consumer Justice Caucus. He also served as co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which he helped build to more than 100 members. Before being elected to Congress, Attorney General Ellison served four years in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Uh, incidentally, the same Senate district I used to live in, Linda Lynn Higgins and uh, Joe Mullery. Prior to entering elective office, he spent 16 years as an attorney specializing in civil rights and defense law. Attorney General Ellison received his law degree from the University of Minnesota Law School in 1990. Please help me welcome our esteemed guests. Before we get further into the program, I wanna offer a few technical instructions for our audience members. We do have a captioner working with us today. To enable captions, click on the live transcription button, commonly located in the bottom Zoom menu bar if you are on a desktop computer, or in the top right menu if you are on a mobile device. Then select show subtitles. If you have questions at any time during today's presentation for our speakers, you can send them via Slido. To send questions, our attendees in person can go to www.slido, that's S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter Spotlight Series. That's no spaces, Spotlight and Series are capitalized. Zoom attendees, check the chat for a direct link to our Slido page. Please note that questions can be submitted anonymously. We encourage you to access Slido throughout the event to check on the submitted question and upvote what others have posted. We can then address questions based on audience, audience interest priority. Um, finally, to the honor students who are joining us today as part of the Spotlight Nexus experience, we'll be convening as soon as the Q&A is over to accompany a couple of our guests over to the Beacon to have dinner, the three of you who have signed up for that. 
And then all of us will be uh, reconvening together at 6.30 in the Nolte Lounge for our discussion. So if I don't see you at dinner, I will see you at 6.30 in Nolte. Finally, our moderator for today and for the Spotlight Series is Kevin Lindsay, CEO for the Minnesota Humanities Center. He's a widely respected advocate and lawyer with a wealth of experience in public policy and education reform. A proven change maker, Kevin's career focuses on finding solutions to complex issues for institutions. He has a passion for inclusion for all, building a stronger democracy and leveraging the power of personal stories. Kevin has held numerous governmental and nonprofit positions such as board chair and interim executive director of Walker West Music Academy and most recently serving as the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Human Rights from 2011 to 29. And I will now turn it over to Ke Kevin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, to the University of Minnesota family, we appreciate you making the space available and entering into this collaboration with us. We're very excited about this six part series to, that's launching today. Uh, I also want to thank the panel. Uh, I, had a chance to know all of you prior to this panel, and I appreciate all of you making yourself available to be a part of this important conversation. So one of the things um, for me that I have been thinking about the last six, seven years about what has happened on some very high profile cases, when we think about Jamar Clark, when we think about Philando Castile, and most recently when we think about the prosecution of Derek Chauvin for the death and murder of Mr. George Floyd. Um, I'm curious, and I'll start with you, Georgia. Uh, what do you think is bringing us to this, this moment of reconciliation, a deep reflection? Is it just these three cases or there's more going on? Well, I think that the disparities that are prevalent in Minnesota contribute also to the response that we see when you look at the inequities in home ownership, when you look at the inequities in education, alongside Minnesota being one of the wealthiest states, but we have like the lowest percentage of home ownership in the black community. So you have the quality of life of black and brown people in this community that is not equal to their white counterparts in tangent with uh, the community demanding justice for Jamar Clark, the community demanding justice for Philando Castile, and uh, there was not uh, a result for the criminal um, justice process that I think the community expected to see in either one of those cases. Contrasted with, I would add to that conversation, uh, Justine Ruschek and how Mohammed Newell Jamar, Philando, those officers in those situations were not held criminally responsible, but with um, Muhammad Noor, he was. And so I think that we started to see, you know, the community who was very active and um, very outspoken in what they wanted to see done. There was some frustration by the, the way even race played a factor in Muhammad Noor's trial. Um, and so, and now seeing that, you know, reversed is, is a whole nother conversation. But I, I do think that there, there were a lot of factors that led up to George Floyd here in this community that contributed to the huge response that we saw, not just here, but nationally as well. Appreciate that. Booker, I, I want to ask you a question, especially with this law enforcement background, and when we think about in the matter of Jamar Clark, the Minneapolis Police Department um, informed individuals that all of the officers would have three days before they would be interviewed as part of the investigation uh, into the death of Mr. Clark. Whereas after the death of Mr. Floyd, you had the police chief taking the position that policy had been violated and actually moving to terminate. So something clearly different that the community saw I'm curious, are there other things that you're seeing about how police chiefs, law enforcement are responding to officer-involved deaths from Jamar Clark to the present?
depending on multiple factors, right? I mean, so for me, the way I'm going to talk to everybody here today is this. I think a lot of times people don't understand is trained uh, ooh, sorry, on the law, right? And how we interpret the law and how we're supposed, our actions are governed by the law. And I think a lot of times we don't do a good enough job explaining to the public what the law is. Now, there's an aspect here that often doesn't get talked about and it kind of did as we start to shift here and focus on the criminal justice system is the prosecution side of this. Right, as police officers and chiefs, we don't decide who gets charged. I mean, ultimately that belongs to a prosecutor. So all of these cases that people have discussed along the way have been reviewed by a prosecutor and it's up to him or her to make that decision whether or not uh, an officer is, is gonna get charged. So when you ask how it's changed, now police officers and chiefs are specifically looking at what criteria are the county attorneys gonna be using when they're determining if, a, if an officer did in fact um, was within the law or was, was outside the law. So I wanna just ask you a follow up within that. One of the things I have been thinking about in the last six, seven years, again, and looking at these respective cases, and let me ask a foundational question for the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, where is that located within state government? What is the relationship with the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and the Department of Public Safety? So uh, one, of the, one of my divisions in my role is the BCA, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Minnesota does not have a state police department. Uh, and I just want everybody to understand, that the state of Minnesota does not have a state police department. The Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, by statute, is a state investigative agency that is set up uh, to assist local law enforcement with investigations. Up until Jamar Clark, by and large, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension was not doing officer-involved shooting investigations. So what happened when Jamar Clark happened, uh, there was a desire and a, there was a desire and a, a community uh, concern that Minneapolis couldn't be impartial in their investigations. So that was farmed out to the BCA which, and I know Attorney General Ellison will talk about this too, which now is kind of what's happened with the Attorney General's office where citizens aren't confident that their elected county attorney is able to make these decisions, so now they're calling for the Attorney General to do that. So the BCAA's role in that is to uh, now investigate officer-involved shootings. There's nothing in state law that requires the BCA to do that. I want to, I want, you know, again, I, my job here is to inform you, there's nothing in state law that requires the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to investigate an officer-involved shooting. If an officer got involved in a shooting right now, we wouldn't send BCA, excuse me, <coughs> BCA agents out unless we were called in to do so. Yeah, and I appreciate you giving that history. Um, in the introduction, it was mentioned that I worked as a commissioner of human rights for the state of Minnesota. And I remember several advocates actually petitioning Governor Dayton to ask the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to lead in the investigation. And as you say, it's not identified within statute. And there's a gentleman by the name of Drew Evans, who is the lead investigator of Jamar Clark and these others. How has Drew, even though it's not by statute, how has he communicated to the public differently, would you say, from Jamar Clark to George Floyd? Well, I think, you know, for a lot of state agencies, people, you know, what we've tried to do since uh, Commissioner Harrington's been there is actually get out into the communities. <laughs> Looks like Kevin got the only workable I, mic. I don't know how I got the only one. <laughs> We were joking earlier that our uh, we had a, a problem with our IT, so yeah. our computers have been down all day, but I get here and everything's working fine. I don't know. Da la la la. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> uh, what was the question again? Sorry, man, I, I was just joking around. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I, I think uh, talking about 
and I'll phrase it this way, Commissioner Harrington, who is the commissioner of the Department mm -hmm. of Public Safety, he, it's important for him, I think, mm -hmm. to give more information, communicate more broadly to the public. Yep. And one of the areas that I'm curious from your vantage point, do you see public safety, do you see through the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, communicating more about investigations? So let's understand, uh, I think what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna talk about the, best, the basic investigative process because everybody always wants information, right? In Minnesota, we have this law called the Minnesota Data Practices Act, which prohibits agencies from in, uh, releasing active investigative data. So when, a, when an officer-involved incident happens, the BCA is the investigative agency. Their job is to conduct a fair and impartial investigation. The Data Practices Act sometimes conflicts with the ability to be transparent and how that investigation is being conducted. Because understand that the officers involved, just like if anybody was involved in a normal criminal activity, all those people have rights. And the integrity of the investigation, from my standpoint and from the BCA standpoint, is the most important aspect of it. Because if we give uh, the attorney general or county attorney an investigation that's not complete, or an investigation that uh, can get holes picked in it, uh, that's going to be problematic, and that's not what any of us want. We all want somebody to go to uh, to a process in which it can view, be viewed as legitimate and as thorough and transparent as possible. So it's, we cannot communicate that information to folks. Now, local police chiefs, on the other hand, and you've seen this recently, when an incident happens, they are releasing the video if they have it. Right, and they typically do that, and I just want everybody here to understand, again, for me, it's an educational standpoint. After the officers have interviewed, they will release the video in some cases. But like if you look at uh, that, that's typically what, what's happening now. And I know everybody wants to see the video. Um, it's always a conflict, even within law enforcement, because you have a chief that's like, I want to get this out. You have the investigators that's like, wait, we can't do that. And then in the meantime, a public narrative develops and by the time the public narrative is set in, it doesn't matter what the video says, right? So that's kind of the balancing act we try to balance with. Can I weigh in a little bit here? So just to get, take Booker's point, if you're trying to find out what actually happened and you release the video immediately, then somebody can get that video and then they can sort of tailor their story to the video. We don't want them to tell, tailor their story at all. We want them to tell, tell the truth and give their story without the benefit of knowing what else is out there. You know, and if you're telling the truth, it should square up with what happened. But if you're not, you re of course you want to know what's on the video so you can say, well, what happened was right before that. You know? So it, 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 I found myself in the odd position of having to defend not immediately release the video because we want to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we get the stories out before people can tailor them. No, I really appreciate that. If you want to hold the mic, Mr. Attorney General, because there is this delicate balancing, right? right? Public's right to know, but we don't want to frustrate government's ability to actually find out the truth and prosecute right. within this. I'm or decline. Or decline. Either one. Right. It's just as important to do one or the other. Right. If an officer didn't, didn't do it, it's not legal, criminally responsible, There's, they should not have to bear the stress of, of that of that situation. And and for some of the folks in the audience, your office just recently declined yeah. prosecuting a case because that doesn't make as much news. You know, we, we, we've accepted some, we've declined some. I mean, it's just part of the, how it works. You know, uh, as Booker said, the, the police and the BCA investigate cases and then we look at the law and see if we can meet the elements of a criminal charge. And if we can, we charge. And if we cannot, then we decline. Again, thinking again from Clark to Floyd, right. there are a lot of advocates around Governor Dayton's table saying the Attorney General's office or a federal prosecutor needs to come in. We can't trust this to a county prosecutor. Curious, your v view vantage point as the Attorney General, as somebody representing members uh, from the Congressional di District in Minneapolis where the incident happened right. with Mr. Clark, I'm curious your thoughts about this delicate balancing act? Well, 
I think that the attorney general should be the prosecutor of last resort in the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is the county prosecutor should be available to take, to take the cases, any kind of case, police case, non-police case, whatever kind of case. And, but if there's, if, if there's reason or if there's some reason to be concerned that the public won't accept the outcome because of the close proximity that prosecutors and police work with every day, then that county prosecutor ought to have the ability and the, and the governor ought to have the ability to just say, no, we're going to move it to the AG's office because no matter, it won't necessarily guarantee a different look. I mean, the facts might be the same and the charges might be the same, but at least the public can have some sense that there was not somebody who probably has social life, probably has known, know somebody, probably does not want to run afoul of uh, somebody who they work with all the time might not call a straight shot. Now, honestly, um, I, so I think that the option ought to be there. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, but, I, but I'm not in a position, quite honestly, to take every officer involved shooting case. I was just gonna ask you, what else is the Attorney General doing in these days? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a good question. We're, we're actually pretty busy. I mean, we, we're doing, um, we just settled a, a, a major charities fraud case like today. Last week, we, we resolved a major wage theft case. We just sued a landlord out in Marshall, Minnesota for bad conduct against some tenants in a, in a manufactured housing community. Uh, we uh, are working hard investigating um, uh, and, and prosecuting civilly, uh, you know, people, the opioid cases, and we just settled some of them, and we're trying to work that out. I'm sure um, these folks got some things to say about the <laughs> opioid crisis. Uh, and so we're actually quite busy just to let everybody know that the AG's office is a constitutional office. It's identified in the Minnesota Constitution, along with the governor, the lieutenant governor, the state auditor, and the secretary of state. We, uh, the legislature can't just get rid of us because we're in the Constitution. You'd need a constitutional amendment to do that. And our job is to be the lawyers for the state. So we represent state agencies like we represent Booker's agency. I'm Booker's lawyer, right? And he, and, you know, with the, with the Department of Correct, Public Safety, but also Corrections and also human Health and Human Services, Veterans Affairs, you name it right on down the line. But then the other thing we do is in addition to representing the agent, state agencies, we have independent authority, something called Parents Patriot Authority, to sue on behalf of the people of the state of Minnesota if we believe that it is warranted. So when Skip Humphrey sued the tobacco manufacturers, that was, he, he that one of the things the AG gets to do is to say, I will put, put on the shoes of the, of the public interest and sue on behalf of the public when I think it's warranted. So I, I, I do that all the time. Skip Humphrey does it. Every AG in Minnesota has done it. And then the third thing we do is, um, we, but, but that includes, criminal prosecutions, right? We've prosecuted, I think, about 28 cases since I've been the AG. You know about one, or maybe two. <laughs> you know about Chauvin and you know about Potter, but you don't know about all the other ones. We do them all the time. They're, not, they're generally not officer involved, right? They're generally not, but they're from greater Minnesota. Hennepin County, Ramsey County, Anoka County, St. Louis County, Olmstead County, uh, and Dakota County, they don't need us. They, they got it covered. We do, we do some of their criminal appeals though, but generally they don't need us. But there's 87 counties, so like 80 of them probably will call us if there's a big ugly murder somewhere. So when my office got involved in the Chauvin case, we weren't new to criminal prosecution. We do it every single day, but we were kind of new to the officer involved and that is different. It is different for a lot of reasons we can go into, but that's just who, what we do and how we do it. No, I appreciate that, and I also appreciate the past work the office did on behalf of the Department of Human Rights as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, we did some. We've done good work <laughs> with you guys. I mean, you know, um, work that I'm really proud of. So, yeah, Georgia, I, I'm interested uh, your perspective for those in the audience. Could you talk a little bit about the work that you did in covering the Chauvin trial, the podcast, uh, the work that you did in really educating the public about what was going on in the Chauvin trial? Absolutely. Uh, so I independently streamed the Chauvin trial and I was one of about
maybe a dozen or two dozen journalists who had access to the courtroom. I was in the courtroom for some of the jury selection and for sentencing. And in partnership with the Humanity Center as well as KMOJ and a few other organizations like Ampers, we did daily radio reporting on uh, the, not just the trial, but the community response as well. And as you guys know, if you were here, it got really intense during, I believe it was the third week when there was another officer involved shooting. And so uh, as a journalist, I'll say, you know, doing the trial all day and then covering and reporting on the uh, protests in the evening and then also the press conferences that would be held by Huntington uh, in, in the evening to kind of give an update on how many people were arrested, if there were any injuries, uh, stuff like that. It was extremely exhausting, but it was very important. Uh, I, I think between March and May, uh, the stream that I was doing had about 5 million views just between March and May. And so what I discovered was in this community specifically, there was this huge need and demand for uh, alternative media to mainstream media. Um, the, the most glaring example actually I think happened after the Chauvin trial when Winston Smith was fatally shot and the Star Tribune led with a report that he was a murder suspect and we later found out that that was not true. And so it's been those kind of moments. I believe that there was also a protest that happened at WCCO because um, the public found out one of their anchors is married to uh, Bob Kroll. So the, the media, I feel like, has been just as criticized, the mainstream media has been just as criticized for their, their role um, and, and how they work together to communicate information. Uh, and when I say work together, I mean with the different law enforcement agencies. Um, and so that, yeah, that's been criticized. And I think another glaring example was the uh, press release that was originally uh, released by John Elder, who was the Minneapolis, or he previously, I think he just left that position about a week ago. Uh, John Elder was a PIO at MPD. The first press release about what happened to George Floyd said that a man died of medical complications during an encounter with police. And that information was distributed by mainstream media to the public almost immediately. And so when you have uh, this system, and this is standard, it's not, ex like, it's not exclusive to Minnesota. I mean, I've worked in other markets, and this is standard practices for the PIO to release something and the media you know, put it out there. But it has caused people to examine the way these systems work together and how can, you, how can you know that you have to vet information when it's coming from a law enforcement agency? And so, yeah, the, the last year and a half working in, in media uh, has been really interesting, but I would say it's been even more interesting being independent and seeing um, the mainstream media constantly examine their processes, whether it's from correcting information, misinformation that's been put out, to even examining the way that they receive and, and process and distribute information from agencies that they historically have been able to trust. You mentioned something earlier about alternative media and independent media. Why is it so important to have both of those areas supported, encouraged, when we're talking about the dynamic which is going in the traditional media? And then I wonder if you could speak to the issue of racial and ethnic diversity that we see within the media? And does that impact how these stories kind of unfold? Well, to that point, I think that's part of why it's important to have alternative and independent media. Because in the last decade or two even, our newsrooms locally have not been diverse. And so we have perspectives that are grossly um, underrepresented in, in the media that we're consuming. And so there's things that are happening in our community that are important and significant to um, different cultures and, and religions than the dominant societies that we're not, we don't even know things are happening uh, because the newsrooms are not diverse. And so it's extremely important to have alternative and independent media outlets, not just so that you have that diversity, uh, but there are, due to advertisers, 
um, <laughs> due to owners having their own political agenda, we have seen that some of these outlets start to slant or they have very insensitive op-ed sections that are highly offensive to certain sections of, of our society. Um, and when you talk about things being uh, balanced, unbiased, uh, w when you historically mainstream media will run a narrative from law enforcement or any other city or government official, and they don't always go out and get the public side. And so I think alternative and independent media while some of the independent journalists I know, they lean all the way to like the public narrative and they don't ever really reach out to city officials. It is important, I think, to have that spectrum, um, but also to understand the media you're consuming. Is it slanted? Is it truly both sides? But also, uh, I think the way that journalism has been challenged in the last year and a half is to really, uh, as, as journalists, ask ourselves, is there always two sides to a story? think sometimes when you have uh, the truth or a fact, you don't always have to try to find the other side to a fact. If it's a fact, it should be presented as that and, and not try to, and I think because there's been this demand to tell both sides, sometimes that's how misinformation is being spread so far and wide because a fact, what is the other side to a fact? Misinformation. <laughs> I appreciate that and appreciate the work that you've, you did because I think that piece about connecting with the public because you authentically came to them. I think there was a lot of things that I heard in your podcast that the community was willing to come back and share with you that I don't necessarily always see in traditional media. So I just wanted to call that out. Um, Booker, Commissioner Harrington, uh, Attorney General Ellison, very first year on the job. Uh, went around the state and had a listening session, about six or seven uh, different spots, and a report was published out of that. I'm wondering from the Department of Public Safety perspective, what's important about that report? Why was that something that you think Commissioner Harrington wanted to undertake? Well, it was, um, you know, for one, we never done that in the state of Minnesota. So the report he's talking about is the commissioner and the attorney general went around the state and we did... Um, a whole comprehensive approach of how do we reduce deadly force encounters, right? I mean, because at the end of the day, police officers don't want to kill people, despite what some reports say. Cops do not want to show up to work and get involved in the deadly force encounter. That is not why people get into this work. On the same token, people, citizens don't want to be involved in deadly force encounters with law enforcement. So what was done was how do we go about reducing uh, deadly force encounters and that work to me was very important and why it was very important and I think sometimes in society especially in this generation the generational piece of 30 second solutions right this is not a 30 second solution right the report that came out the implementations that are going to be put in place and have been put in place they're going to take time but at least the effort was done and I believe it was the first time it was done in the country. And I think the report and the recommendations, once enacted and continue to be enacted, I think 10 years from now, if we're fully enacted, we'll be having a different, different discussion regarding law enforcement, uh, daily force encounters with citizens. Thank you. When we did this, it wasn't in reaction to a crisis, right? So often some horrific act happens and then we go do a study or something. This time we just engaged in a, and we had law enforcement and uh, civil rights activists. And we had, and we brought everybody to the table. Not all the conversations were as sweet and nice. Some of them were tough, but it was important that we stuck to it. And on the first meeting, you remember the first meeting Booker? That was a rough <laughs> ride. Boy, we got cussed out and talked about bad, but we didn't stop, we kept going. Because we, we thought it was important, and I think that it was, we were a little, you know, prescient, you know. A year later, you know, the Floyd crisis happens. So there were five pillars within the report. I, had, I saw community healing and engagement, prevention and training, investigations and accountability, policy and legal implications, and officer wellness. And again, it wasn't just centered 
on officer-involved shootings. It was a more holistic view. Community healing and engagement. That's not typically what we think of, of the Attorney General's office or the Department of Public Safety. Why was that so important to center that within the report? Booker's reaching for his microphone. He was a little <laughs> oh, quicker no, Keith, than you. Keith, you, you want to take this? I can take it too. Yeah. No, no, uh, yeah. So let's think about this, right? And I mean, me personally, I try to make it a habit to at least, you know, a couple times a year talk to someone who has been involved in significant crimes, right? The, the community aspect of this, and I'm just going to specifically speak to African Americans, and again, I'm not speaking for all of African Americans because none of us are qualified to do that. But in some instances for African Americans where you've been told your whole life that you, know, you can't do anything, um, you're not worth anything, and then you look around and you look at your circumstance, right? Whenever someone doesn't have a purpose, circumstances is going to dictate how they act. So these people, a lot of times they have this huge trauma, right, that, that's associated with their behavior. So the, the trauma piece, if you could fix the trauma, we thought that you could help reduce some of the deadly force encounters with law enforcement. Because if I think highly of myself or I have self-confidence in myself, then I'm not gonna sell drugs, right, regardless if I'm hungry or not, right? So that, that was some of the thought process behind it. In addition to understanding that a lot of these communities did have systematic trauma with law enforcement, right? And, and from a law enforcement perspective, recognizing that these communities do have trauma. And I, and I use my own example in this. Uh, I was born and raised in North Minneapolis. My dad hated the cops. I mean, flat out hated it. My dad never saw me in uniform, right? The only time he saw me in uniform was he had a stroke and I had to go to the hospital uh, to make the call that it was time to, for him to, to pass on. The, my entire career, he never saw me in uniform, right? And there are many, and I was his son. And there, there are many people in our community that do have that feeling towards law enforcement. It's important for police officers to recognize that. And if we could start, if well people don't make bad decisions in general. That's it, refreshing to hear is that police don't always look at individuals as sort of creating sin or being bad, listing them sort of being innocent, right? Mr. Attorney General, same, same question to you. I'm, I'm curious, why was it so important? Well, it was, it, there's a number of things that were important. I'll, I'll, I'll add in, officer, officer wellness was important. Officer wellness was important because imagine this, your shift starts at, what time does it start? Five, six? Okay, your shift starts at eight o'clock at night. You get a call. And the first thing you see is some lady whose face is swelled up because she got punched in the face by her spouse. She's in tears, and you're trying to get her health care, medical care, and then also you know, hand her off to the EMS guys, but then you got to go investigate a crime. You get another call. You got a dead kid on the ground. You saw that. You cannot unsee that. You get another call. Now you have maybe an older lady who's raped. Then you leave that call and see some kid, 17 years old, sprawled out on the street, bull, bullet holes through his body, he's dead. Now, maybe not every night is that dramatic, but you add it up and you see a lot of pain over the course of time. How do most of us deal with that kind of pain? Well, we internalize it. Some of us drink. Uh, police officers have a lot of divorce. Um, you know, so you, if, and so one day, uh, you call up, you come up to a corner, and you say, hey, what are you guys doing in the corner? And then the kid tells you, F you, what you doing? You can't tell me what to do. So like, you get out of the car this time, and you're not having it, and you do some things that maybe you regret, maybe you don't, but you're, they're not approved by the handbook. <laughs> you understand? And then, of course, you're spitting foul language back to them, as bad as they are to you. You just sort of become part of that. We've got to do officer wellness, because police officers are people. And people subjected and witnessing a lot of trauma and will experience vicarious trauma and will internalize that. So you, you got, we got to create systems so officers can say, you know, I just feel stressed out, man. So, and then there are problems because let's just say an officer gets sued. Let's just say the officer either did or didn't do it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they did it or not. 
they get sued and the discovery process starts and now you know they got they, maybe they say that i felt really guilty to a psychologist or something you know and now this is in a record now you're dealing with that and it's being used against you in a court my point is we don't have space, safe spaces for officers to decompress cool down take a retreat we need to have more spaces for people who do this kind of work every day to work on their own wellness and their own health and their own um well-being you know so that was a part of what we did and we we looked at how certain after action uh things happen and looked at how we might need to change the law so that people can be more disclosive about how they're feeling you know without having to fear that this is going to end up somewhere um so that was an important thing but we need but community wellness community healing for officers and for people is is really really key and there's a lot of stress out there and the truth is you know, the one thing about the, the, the Justine Rusta case that was so unusual is that generally that kind of thing doesn't happen in that kind of neighborhood. Generally, that thing doesn't happen to people who look like Christi, Justine Rusta. And it was so unusual. Usually the officer shooting is not black. So it was weird. It was a, sort of an outlier in that way. But the normal case is, um, you know, a lot of trauma, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain generationally speaking as booker said officers seeing a lot of pain we've got to figure out how to interrupt that cycle and we've got to act we've got to acknowledge the truth which is you know we've got to deal with this 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 trauma and, and it could probably turn down the temperature save some lives let's take a look at it from a different perspective but i think a lot of what we just heard from the two of you is also true georgia you were in on the ground during the, the protests at night concerning the prosecution of Derek Chauvin. Then you were also on the ground covering what was going on in the community and then expressing their frustration over how criminal justice had been meted out in the past concerning the shooting of Dante Wright. First, can you share what it's like being on the ground in that? And then as a member of a media, what your experience was there yeah being on the ground is is really intense um you know you really have to stay vigilant uh because law enforcement agencies are using tear gas oftentimes to get uh individuals to disperse um, i was tear gassed on more than one occasion i was hit with a rubber bullet um, threatened to be arrested on, on several occasions despite that my press pass was showing, um, maced as well. And so, yeah, it, it's very intense um, to be out there. And uh, I, I will say for uh, Dante Wright, uh, I covered that almost every single day after George Floyd was killed. I couldn't cover that every single day. It was too dangerous. Um, we saw Linda Toledo, uh, who was a, a journalist who was shot in the eye and lost eyesight. We saw a CNN reporter who was live on television arrested while his white colleagues were allowed to continue doing their work. And so uh, when you're faced against those um, types of circumstances, you have to make a, not only a professional decision, but also a personal decision because you do know that there's a, a likelihood that you could be arrested, there's a likelihood that you could be injured. And uh, it, it's really frustrating having done this work for more than a decade and, and you know, you're trained in school that you have the constitutional right as a member of the press to be out and reporting. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll shine light on one day where I felt like uh, there was great interaction between media and, and uh, law enforcement. It was the day that Chauvin was bailed out. There was a large protest that happened because the third precinct was burnt down. Uh, folks marched over to, I believe it was the fifth precinct. And we as press were given very clear instruction on where we could go. And uh, having those types of communications being given properly allowed the press who wanted to comply, which was 100% of us, the opportunity to comply and not be harmed, 
or be arrested. And so um, now there's actually an active lawsuit that's happening to try to mitigate, um, you know, the injuries that have been sustained um, to also compensate for those who were arrested or had equipment broken. Um, but we have been engaged as press uh, by the state to have conversations about how how can we create environments where as press we can safely go out and do our jobs because we're just there to do our jobs just like law enforcement is and that is supposed to be protected under the first amendment um and and we haven't seen that and so even reflecting on dante Wright, there was instruction given to the press it was really poor instruction the instruction was go stand in front of this apartment building if you're a press um, and we knew that they were getting ready to arrest people and likely tear gas. And I just, knowing the tear gas was coming, reflected on, you know, okay, if I go do what they told me to do, I'll be the first person to catch the tear gas because where they asked us to stand was right across from their fence. And so in, in the journalism community, we've been asking ourselves, why can't there be a press pit or why can't um, the safety of journalists be considered when these strategic communications are happening and you have interagency effort to uh, quell these protests. You, we, we've seen, I've seen DNR conservation officers responding to protests, you know, and so they're, they're working across agencies, a state patrol, um, different um, officers coming from out of state. So if you have some strategic communication that's happening, and that organization and planning is happening in anticipation of these protests. Why aren't journalists being considered in those plans? Okay, where can the journalists safely go to do their job? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think having those conversations uh, hopefully will be helpful, but obviously, hopefully we won't have to be in that situation again. All right, appreciate that. Um, Attorney General Ellison, let me come back to you for a second. Um, you just recently uh, made an announcement of the creation of a, a new unit within your department. Um, I wonder if you could speak to why you felt that was so important, what you seek to accomplish with this new unit. And is this something, again, where Minnesota's kind of out on the forefront of, of other states? Well, what we started is the- I think George is passing oh, yeah. the mic. Thank you, George. What we started is a conviction review unit and uh, it's prosecutor initiated. For the whole history of American law, a person who uh, felt they were unjustly convicted could retain counsel and then seek a writ in court to be released. And, uh, but what we're doing now and what we're seeing more and more across prosecutorial offices, across the country even, usually at the district court level, at the district level, is we're saying, look, we're not gonna wait. We're gonna just, if we think that somebody's not, if there's this conviction's not square up, we're gonna, we're gonna move to, you know, we're gonna, it, on our own, we're gonna try to make sure only the guilty are convicted and the innocent are not. Now, uh, we started this unit through a grant we got from the Department of Justice. Uh, just so you know, we are scrambling to make sure we can sustain the effort. We think it is very important that we do. Um, and uh, we have pulled together a community of, of advisory board that uh, has helped set up our uh, screening criteria. Uh, we launched on August 1st. We have a number of cases in the office already and we are evaluating them. Right now, we're working only on wrongful conviction. I don't believe that there's tons of wrongful convictions in Minnesota. I was a criminal defense attorney for 16 years, and I would venture to say 90% of my clients were willing to plead guilty to something that they did, but about 10% said I didn't do it, which is, which is and we fought to, in those cases. We fought in the other cases too, but uh, across the country, there's been a lot of people who have been exonerated after um, after they've been wrongfully convicted. What, what you know, the 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 Central Park Five may come to mind, you know, uh, but um, 
There's these, a, are, these are the five gentlemen accused of raping someone. Yeah, they, they were accused of raping a woman, a jogger in Central Park. And turns out that the, the case was always sketchy. There were some very, very... And, you know, these cases usually happen, Kevin, when there's a horrific crime, like a crime that just shocks the conscience and the public wants somebody to be held accountable. There's a lot of pressure on law enforcement to get somebody. And, you know, sometimes the right person is not the one who gets got. And uh, in Minnesota, we want to make sure that if there's credible evidence of innocence, uh, that we're going to do something about it. So we're working hard. We're working with University of Minnesota Law School. We, we believe that uh, this is important work to be doing. And I will tell you, we're not doing it now. But in the future, once we kind of get solid, we actually want to open up and look at sentencing, too. I'll give you an example why. Let me paint a little picture for you. Say you got a man and a woman. The man says, come with me. And they get in the car and they drove over to a garage. The guy pulls out a gun and says, where's my money? He says, oh, I don't have it, I don't have it. Blam, 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 kills him. And then says, you put this in their purse and do something with it. They get caught and the guy says, I did it, I'll plead guilty. If you let me uh, plead guilty to second degree intentional, that's uh, 25 years and I have to do 17, and, but I'll save everybody money if you let me plead guilty on that. And by the way, he reached for a gun and so I shot him in self-defense, but I'll drop it if you just let me plead guilty. She says, I didn't do anything. I was just there. I didn't plan it. All I did is took the gun from him and hit it because this scary guy told me that I better do it. And yes, he was my boyfriend, but it was always, mm. she goes to trial and loses and gets life without the possibility of parole, meaning she literally gets death. But on the installment plan, she leaves prison in a casket many years from now. Now, is that a fair sentence? What do y'all think, by show of hands? You think it is one? Well, everybody thinks it's a fair sentence, I guess. I don't, because I didn't see any hands go up, but anybody think it's a fair sentence? If it's a fair sentence, put your hand up. If it's, a fair, it's, if it's not a fair sentence, put your hand up. Okay. That's, so, that's where you got us teach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so my point is, I think that that's a sentence. So by, by statute, by statute, the court might say, ma'am, I'm sorry you got convicted. I'm not certain you're utterly blameless, but I'm, not sure, I'm sorry you are looking at life without the possibility of parole. I don't have any discretion as the judge. This legislature said I must give you this sentence, so here's your sentence. You see what I'm saying? What, I mean, you know, then the, the woman's only hope is the pardon board. You know, and, and, and then, you know, you have to, and they, the court just decided today that you got to be unanimous. And so uh, there's no two thirds, it's, you know, there's, it's got to be unanimous. So we want to one day bring up the issue of fair sentencing and, and, and just say, look, prosecutors around the state, is this really a good outcome? Do you feel good about this? Many people will say, I don't feel good about this, but that's what the law required. So think about this, somebody who's running for office, trying to, look, trying to outdo their opponent, showing that they're more tough on crime than the other guy, says, I'm for life without the possibility of parole. And the other guy says, me too, because he doesn't want to look soft on crime. Next thing you know, legislators who've never met the defendant, don't know anything about the case, are literally deciding the sentence. And the people who know most about it, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, the judge, the probation officer, even the police officers, they have, their hands are utterly tied. Once she's convicted, it's done. So we want to eventually look into sentencing as well. No, same for juveniles, same problem for juveniles. And I appreciate the way that you laid that out because I think we talk about retribution yeah. in the criminal justice, but we rarely talk about rehabilitation yeah. or where I think you were also going and leading us. What do we really mean by justice? So question for you, Mr. Attorney General, how often do prosecutors really balance these multiple aims that we seek to achieve in the criminal justice system and really aspire to achieving justice? A prosecutor who wants to do a good job has a hard job. <laughs> because crimes, you, because one course of conduct 
might fit a number of crimes. And what you charge will determine what the sentence is going to be. So we say the judge decides sentences, kind of. The truth is, what you charge will determine what the, what in the sentencing and the person's criminal history will lead you to a box in the sentencing guideline grid. So in many ways, what you pick is what that person's probably going to get. And you can pick high or you can pick low, right? And so the bottom line is, uh, you know, there are jurisdictions where they got something called a friars club. You know what that is? You get to go have lunch with the gang, with the gang if, you have ex if you have asked for the death penalty and received it in a case. To me, that's a horrific thing, and I'm, go I'm so glad this state doesn't have the death penalty. But the truth is you have a tremendous amount of discretion. You cannot charge things that maybe could be charged. You can charge things where you're stretching. You can charge a complaint higher on the hope that the defendant will accept a lower plea, but if they don't, then they're gonna get stuck with the higher one. Can you say that again? Because it, it, I don't know if we know enough about that in the criminal justice system. You can charge somebody with, a, as long as the person's conduct technically meets the elements of the offense, you can charge that higher charge. And you can charge a lesser included. You can hope that the person, you can offer the person a lesser included to settle the case, but if they don't take it and they go to trial and they lose on the top count, they just got the top count. So what I'm saying is there's a tremendous amount of discretion. Being a prosecutor is, a, is not an easy job. And I can tell you that as a defense attorney, in many ways, your job is a little easier because all your job is to do is to win. You cannot violate the law or break the ethical code, but your duty is being a zealous advocate. As a prosecutor, your job is not zealous advocate. Your job is minister of justice. And if your idea of justice is inflicting maximum pain on a defendant, that, that's unfortunate. That's how come you get a Curtis Flowers type case. Who knows about the Curtis Flowers case? For those of you who don't know who Curtis Flowers was, Curtis Flowers did not kill anyone, but he was accused of it. Put on trial six times, six times by the same prosecutor. Now that's vindictive right there. <laughs> that is, and, and so that's an extreme example. Even Justice Kavanaugh, not known for his liberal sensibilities, found that the, uh, his, the, the Curtis Flowers' rights were violated because the prosecutor was systematically striking every single black juror from the jury pool. This is in Mississippi. You should read about it. There's a pretty intense po uh, podcast about it. Um, but, uh, you know, the prosecutor has a lot, a lot of power. My son's a prosecutor. He's a prosecutor in Ramsey County. Young guy, got out of law school, went to Tulane Law School, came up here, was a public defender in Hennepin, and then got a, got a raise to go be a prosecutor in Ramsey, so he's working for John Choi now, and it's, it's emotional, it's tough, it's not easy, but it, it, you've, somebody's got to do it because you got to have, you can't have a society where people can hurt other people, steal from other people, injure other people, brutalize other people, and there's no accountability. That means you have impunity or immunity, and that means lawless behavior just even gets worse. So you've got to have a system that does that, but how justice is defined, ultimately, I mean, the, the, the district attorney has a lot to do with it, and the individual prosecutor has a lot to do with it. And I, I always want prosecutors who have a sense of what it means to, 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 to suffer, to be a victim, to be falsely accused. I think every prosecutor in America ought to spend a day a year in a prison listening to prisoners. Because some folks, they earn their right to be there by what they did, but you should never be naive about the consequences of what uh, you're doing to somebody. And you know, I'm glad to hear you say that you talked to somebody who's been in the criminal justice system because you know, uh, if you're gonna put somebody in a prison, you ought to know a little bit about what it is to be in there. And that even if you just walk through there, you ought to be able to, to get a sense of what that is. I've never met, a, I've, not, I've been in many, many prisons. I've never been in a country club prison. <laughs> and every prison that I've ever walked into was a place I, don't, I would not want to be. Don't ever believe that prisons are some walk in the park there, dangerous, 
harmful places to the human psyche, but yet some people have earned the right to be there. And, but we should, be, we should not be naive about what that means. And that's where that delicate balancing, because we as humans aren't perfect. Right. And we also got to make sure that it's only the ones that deserve to be there, yeah. are there. Georgia, you spent some time at the Minnesota legislature this past session. Um, was there a bill concerning uh, limiting the ability or creating penalties for individuals who were raising their voice in, in protest? And if so, could you talk to us a little bit about that? There was a bill that was authored um, by a Republican uh, who's in office, and that, that bill would limit people who had been charged with any level of uh, protest. It, it would limit their ability to get uh, public funding. Uh, it would limit their ability to get um, tuition, state-provided tuition, uh, any WIC or any type of public aid. Um, and I, that bill didn't go far, but it was, I think, concerning, uh, particularly in, in this community because there had, because protesting has been so prominent over the last, you know, five to, to seven years. And um, also that is another instance where people who are out in the community protesting also are protected under the, the First Amendment. And so to see legislation drafted that would counter that, uh, it, it feels uh, like a violation of, of people's constitutional rights. Um, and so, yeah, it, it didn't really go anywhere, though, Kevin. And there was a lot of criticism. Uh, and I, I think that uh, legislatures did not, you know, really get behind that bill uh, because they saw how, how it contradicted people's First Amendment rights. But this is, for others within the audience, I do recall several instances in which bills had been introduced to potentially criminalize the ability for folks to protest lawfully. Um, question for um, Booker here within this space. You, you have some familiarity uh, concerning controlling crowds could you speak to some of the logistical challenges and the balancing act that you take in the respective position that you have? Yeah, and uh, again, I'm gonna use this as an educational standpoint. Um, if I was in uniform, I would stand up and I would show you my duty belt, right? A police officer on his or her duty belt has uh, magazine pouches, taser, mace, gun, right? When you have a thousand people out there and some of them are destroying property, what on that belt does that police officer have to move that many people? Nothing. There's nothing on that officer's belt that's going to move that many people. That's why there's tear gas deployment. Now, the peaceful, I think the society needs to have the discussion about what is it to peacefully protest, right? Peacefully protest does not involve Molotov cocktails. It does not involve uh, paint. It does not involve um, putting uh, unarmed or unmanned vehicles, putting bricks on them and running them at lines of police officers. That is not a peaceful protest. And I think from a society standpoint, one thing that we have to understand is yes, people have the right, you have the utmost right to go out and peacefully protest. That is your first amendment right. We don't have the right to destroy government property, people's property, and to physically harm people who are in uniform. We, we don't have those rights. And the balancing act here is, I think this is a society standpoint where you're looking at some communities that are trying to figure out how do we get back to a point where we're having peaceful protests, right? Because a, a whole idea of a protest, right, is, is civil disobedience, right? It's not to be in line. But what happens is, is one of the things that we, how do we try to navigate that is try to work with some of the organizers to say, here, we can tell you at night, if you're out there at night, the likelihood that something bad is gonna happen increases. Because that's when those folks that come out that don't wanna peacefully protest, that's when they come out. And having those discussions have been uh, beneficial uh, for folks, but I think you know, one thing that, you know, police officers, we're gonna make mistakes. Right? But when you have these large groups of people and people embed themselves in there and they're intent on destroying property and they're intent on causing chaos, 
it is extremely difficult for us as cops to navigate that. And again, no mistake, uh, I don't think we should be able to, it's hard you know, for us to not make mistakes and mistakes are gonna get made. But I think it's from a police standpoint and understand in Minnesota, we only have 10,000 cops, right? And like when you talked about it, you look and you see DNR officers and all these other state troopers out there. The state of Minnesota, we only have 10,000 cops for 5.7 million people. That's it. There is no backdrop. I mean, once we, you know, and you got to think cops you know, going out there on shifts, it is extremely difficult to manage that with the amount of police officers that we have. So, I mean, it's, it's I think that's the discussion legislatively that we're going to have to have is what is a peaceful protest? Thank you. There are some questions from the audience. Encourage folks to send those in. I'm going to turn and ask a couple of questions which have come in. Uh, the first one, there's a major disagreement whether more police means less crime. Um, how would you answer that? How would you think about that? Is more police mean less crime? I'll take that one and I'll pass it down. <laughs> uh, police officers, we do not prevent crime, right? I mean, any chief that tells you that cops prevent crime, we don't. We deter crime. Cops deter crime. And what you've seen now is the lack of the deterrent factor out there. And that is the reason why the increase. I'll give you an example. How many people here drive on freeways, right? Have you ever seen people drive as fast as they were now? No. Have you ever thought in your life where, you know, some of you watch some of the, 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 uh, the street, the hot rodders, where they would shut down an entire intersection and do donuts in the intersection? automatic gunfire, right? When I grew up, and even like before the last, in, in 19, someone might shoot off three, four rounds, but you weren't getting the 50, 20 rounds that we're getting now. That deterrent factor is what we're missing. And what's happened is in a city like Minneapolis, where, you know, Minneapolis didn't have enough cops to begin with anyway. And I mean, what I'm telling you here is you can get out your phone and you can research anything I tell you. The city of Atlanta, is only about 40,000 more people than Minneapolis. The city of Atlanta had 2,000 cops. Minneapolis at the height had 950. And now when you're down to 500, all those cops are doing is going call to call to call to call. And what does that do to the cops, right? If every call I'm going to is a fight call, because I mean, really, that's the only thing you can respond to now. If you get your house broken into, anybody lives in Minneapolis, you get your house broken into, they're going to tell you to come to the precinct or file an online report, right? And if you're doing that, it, it, it's tough on the officers. But bottom line is, if you have an adequately staffed police force, you will get that deterrent factor down. But it doesn't matter how many cops you have. You are never going to prevent all crimes. Another question. What does the panel think of residency mandates for police departments? For example, 40% of officers must reside in the city. I have a feeling uh, Attorney General Ellison has probably had this question before, but I'm also curious, Georgia, what have you heard from people in the community on this? Is this something that advocates feel passionate about? Yeah, I, from what, what I've heard from community is uh, they feel, uh, the folks I've interviewed at least, that having cops who live in the communities that they work in would create uh, more uh, morale. It, it would require uh, the people who are in uniform to be more invested in their communities and then to be connected, to have relationship. And so instead of uh, responding to a call where you're unfamiliar with the household or the family that you're dealing with, you may have knowledge uh, that maybe there is someone in this home who has uh, mental health issues. And so having that knowledge, having that connection to the community, uh, I think would empower officers to respond in a different way. I feel like a more um, a, a, a more prepared way. You know, they would have that preconceived understanding for the most part, and maybe not all, to all calls, but it would be more likely if they lived in that neighborhood that they would be connected to the families that lived there, maybe the people who are more likely to be causing issues and have some context also. If uh, there was uh, one person I interviewed, um, uh, Buddy McLean, 
who ended up robbing a bank because his brother needed a kidney transplant and his family didn't have the money, you know, and not obviously that doesn't justify what he did, but you know, it's different when you're thinking of someone just went and robbed a bank versus like he was in this desperate situation. And so I think that um, while we should deter crime and, and whatnot, the understanding I have gotten from people who have advocated for officers to live in the communities they serve is that there would be this deeper connection to the community, the neighborhood, and uh, better relationships with the people who they're supposed to be protecting and serving. I live in North Minneapolis too, and I remember Booker before he was a, a police officer. And he was always a kid who cared about community, had his own ideas about the world. I knew he was going somewhere the whole time. And the fact that he is a not just a police officer, but a law enforcement leader now, I mean, I don't have to explain to Booker Hodges that just because a kid has saggy pants doesn't mean he's dealing drugs. I don't have to explain to Booker Hodgers that just because a kid says, what you, what you bothering me for? That is, you don't need to, as an officer, get out of your car and slap some sense into this kid because he sassed you. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that we benefit from when the officers know the people in the community. On the other hand, officers are individuals who have a right, and they have argued, and it has been argued, that an individual has an indi right to live where they want to live. But okay, if that's true, then why does almost 90% of Minneapolis police officers not want to live in Minneapolis? I mean, that's a legitimate question. Apart from your rights, let's talk about why you choose not to live in this community. And I think that we've got to ask ourselves, I think it would be very good, and maybe Rondo's already doing this, but it would be good to say, we are going to give a preference for people who live in Minneapolis. We're not making you live here, but if you live here, you're gonna get extra points on your exam to join. I mean, we, need, we do need to incentivize people living in the community that they serve. At the same time, if I was a police officer and every time I was in the middle of dinner, somebody's knocking on the door saying, hey, there's a squirrel in the tree or what, I might not love that. But, you know, but the, but the point is, it, it, the fact that such an amazingly high percentage don't live in our community is to our disadvantage. And you get the impression that the officers don't know and quite, and to be candid, don't always respect the people who they're paid to protect and serve. Take, uh, take uh, you know, um, Bob Kroll, you know. He lives significantly outside the Twin Cities and I mean, it's a lot easier to run up a bunch of complaints if you never have to face the people in the grocery store. <laughs> Maybe you'd be a little bit more polite if you actually had to see these folks at, the, at your kid's football game. So those, those are just a few thoughts. Booker, did you want to add something? Yeah, and I, so for me, residency is something that's important, and I know most police chiefs don't agree with me when I say this, but I 100% support residency because I've always lived where I work. But Minneapolis is a unique situation, and I'm just gonna explain it this way. Um, say I grew up in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and there's 20 cops in that police department. And I graduate from school, I wanna go work for Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids doesn't have any jobs. Minneapolis has jobs. So now I leave Grand Rapids and I go to Minneapolis, right? If we really wanna solve residency, people in these communities need to step up and be police officers. Because this problem is almost essentially urban. It's not greater Minnesota cops live where they work. But again, you know, when you go to this part where people in the neighborhoods aren't becoming cops, you're gonna continue to have this problem. But I, I do feel that cops, you should live, and the analogy I use is 15 minutes or 15 miles uh, whichever is, is, is closer or whichever is further uh, from where you work. And at least, you know, you're not living in Ham Lake, you're not living in Hugo, you know, that gets you to Richfield or, or Brooklyn Park or Brooklyn Center, right? Okay, can I ask you a question? Floor. Yeah. So, and again, I'm not asking to talk out of school and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I can't tell you that is a perfectly acceptable answer. <laughs> but when you talk to kids, and I know you know a lot of kids, mm -hmm. 
and you say, hey, I'm a police officer, how often do, what do they tell you? I mean, do they say, I don't, because, you know, um, are, do we have a problem? Do, 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 does policing have an image problem in terms of career choice for kids? Oh, absolutely. Um, and when I talk to kids, I always, and this is my thought for you all too, <laughs> I always say, don't let nobody tell you how to think. Do your own homework, right? Because a lot of times what people are fed is somebody else's experience that gets passed down and this doesn't actually equal your own experience. And I say law enforcement, even to you all, is a great career. And I mean, you look at it like this, you know, and it, what I used to a lot of kids who were in the city is, you'll see your grandma, your mom, your dad, you know, working to 65, 70 years old. As a cop, you get done at 55. And you're gonna make what you made working for the rest of your life, right? And at the end of the day, for me, that, that's the financial part. But the purpose part is, you know, for me personally, it's like, I know my life is worth less than any of your lives in here. That's what I sign up for, right? And that's the purpose aspect of, how do you really want to serve your community? What better way to do it than to be a protector uh, in your community? And most kids get it, but just the image that they have of cops. <laughs> you know, it's like me dressed like this is different than me in uniform. Because the minute I put the uniform on, now I'm not Booker no more. I'm the automaton, and that's hard to get over. <laughs> so uh, the, I'm sorry. I was just going to say there's a couple questions that come in, and I think it there's a tie to what I think this part of the conversation. So for some individuals, they're hearing this and they're saying, okay, but what about the amount of, of, of money and resources that's in law enforcement? Would that be better served with an education or in housing or in other areas? Um, so the economic aspect, society has to make difficult choices, scarce resources, where to put them. Now, some may argue, and maybe this calls for us to relook at our tax system and be able to bring more resources to bear into in the public square. And then I think the other piece that I'm seeing in here is how do we build trust, build uh, new ways of maybe thinking about law enforcement? Because I bet most people in this office audience, when you said cop, they thought of somebody who had a gun on the side and a badge as opposed to a variety of different careers that exist within public safety. And I wonder, do we need to broaden how our vision of what we talk about in law enforcement and in public safety? I think it'd be good to hear from all of us, but I just want to say very quickly, I, I, I do not subscribe to the defund the police school of thought. I've never said it, yeah, I never will. Having said that, our society has underfunded housing, underfunded uh, early childhood education, underfunded healthcare, underfunded mental health. We've underfunded all these things. And then when, these things, when, when the rubber hits the road and people are unhoused, suffering from mental health breakdown, uh, suffering from an education system that did not equip them for life, Oftentimes, our answer, not his answer, our answer is, you deal with them. That's wrong. We cannot get by with society on the cheap. If we do, we will end up with civil unrest or what we used to call riots. Don't call them that anymore because we, we don't. But whatever you want to call it, people in the streets really upset in large numbers. And so it is important for our society. I mean, I was talking to some business people the other day. I said, what is the business case for the status quo? What is the business case for the 500 office buildings burned to the ground on Lake Street? Insurance money being paid out, everybody pays more. What's the business case for the status quo? You don't want to do it. You, you know, you don't want to do change. You don't want to change. What's the business case for the status quo? Because there were, and I'll just use the term civil unrest because of unfortunate police community interactions, often racially tinged. They occurred in 1919 in Chicago, the Chicago riots, look them up. 1935 in Detroit, 1943 in Detroit, and then all over the country in 1967, and then after that, LA riots, 
After that, T-neck New Jersey. After that, well, let's go on and on and on. What if we just solved the problem? <laughs> what if we just said, you know what? We're going to have an inclusive society. We're going to share opportunity. It would save us a lot of money, and it would be better, and it would make it life safer for Booker and his family. And he, his his I don't know. Are you married, man? His wife wouldn't have to worry about him when he leaves the house in the morning. So our society has refused to deal with the underlying problems. And we say we're just going to incarcerate our way out of it. He's the front door to the incarceration system, right? I guess I am the, the middle door, <laughs> you know? And so that's all I want to say about allocation of resources and investment. And that gets to the idea that Two million people sort of rotate through the criminal justice system within either federal or state prisons. And you have the highest incarceration rate of any industrialized country in the entire world is the United States. Our, our population is a third of, of, of China, and we incarcerate significantly more, more people than China, and we call China an authoritarian state. Booker or Georgia, either one of you want to? Georgia? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to where we started with the conversation about the disparities and the inequities and, and localizing it even specifically to Minnesota, that again, we're one of the wealthiest states but have low home ownership, low uh, education turnouts, huge gaps. Uh, and so I, I absolutely think that uh, funding some of these uh, systems would help. But also, I feel like after George Floyd was killed, there was a lot of money that was thrown a lot of different ways, and it didn't necessarily solve the problem either. I, I do think uh, that we're, what we're seeing Ellison do in terms of looking at the system and dissecting the system and, and trying to change the actual systems that are producing these outcomes, uh, investing in that work, I think, would actually create more lasting change than just throwing money aimlessly at some of these problems without really addressing the systematic issues that are producing these outcomes. Thank you. So for me, um, I think, you know, obviously these areas are under-resourced, but, and again, I'm going to say something probably most people disagree with, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> so the one aspect that we have not concentrated on we cannot spend our way out of this problem. The one thing that we haven't done is spent time building up individuals, right? And I mean, until we build up individuals, right? I mean, if you really talk to these kids, they have been told their whole life, you can't do nothing. You're, you're not gonna be nothing, right? And when people come in and wanna help, they come in with their prescribed help and they don't ask the community what they actually need so we can start uplifting some individuals because we can spend all the money in the world. But if you don't lift up that individual person. And, and that's coming from somebody who grew up in the Northside projects. Now you might hear about North Minneapolis, but there's only a thousand of us that lived in the projects. You know, and that's one of the things for me was, don't tell me, you know, you wanna help and then bring in your prescribed help. Actually ask us what we need. And until we start building up individuals, we can spend all the money we want because what happens when you arrest somebody right you ask them do you got kids okay well now dad is gone right how are you gonna what 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 type of life is that person gonna have when dad's not there and i think what we again i know i'm sounding like a broken record and people don't like this answer but we have to start building up individuals because if we don't do that we're going to continue to spend money and we're going to continue to have the same results georgia i want to know if I've heard you say this. It's important for the black community to claim a narrative. And that's kind of what I hear Booker saying. How important from your perspective and talking to the public about claiming, owning the narrative? Yeah, I think that, and again, centralizing media in this, uh, a lot of times we'll turn on the news and we'll see these statistics. Like I've thrown out the statistic on home ownership in the black community, right? That only 17% of black um, Minnesotans own a home. So what does it feel like to be the, what is that, the other 83? What does it feel like to live in a community and work your whole life and not qualify for a home loan? What is, what is that lived experience? What does that mean for your children when you're going from apartment lease to apartment lease and you can't afford 
uh, decent uh, housing and then you end up in the projects with your kids and now your kids are experiencing you know violence or poverty like what is that lived experience and so I think it is important that the black community absolutely own its own narrative and tell these stories uh, because also what I do know is true that we can paint this picture of what it's like to grow up in the projects and how terrible it is but there are some very dynamic uh, people who come out of the projects, who are resilient, who are resourceful. Uh, there is amazing uh, things happening. Uh, creative, uh, it's a very creative community as well, very innovative. And so if we also approach those communities and those people with this preconceived notion that it's all bad or they're violent or criminals, um, we're also doing ourselves a disservice uh, because like you said, if you invest in them and you um, you build those people up, they have a higher likelihood of fulfilling their their uh, full potential. And so uh, what I'm seeing in mainstream media is that they're not really uh, going into those communities and finding those stories. Um, someone who did, and I, I think they did a great job of this, there's a documentary called Love Them First. And you had two former people who worked at CARE 11 who kept going out to Lucy Laney, um, the school in North Minneapolis, to do all of these crime uh, stories, how there's you know gunfire right in front of the school, but actually going in and getting to know the principal uh, and how much she invests in her students, getting to know one of the teachers who has created a, a boxing program for kids who um, have anxiety and who have experienced trauma, they they went in and they found those gems they found those stories and so when you have uh, again uh, storytellers who are invested in the community and who actually know the community and aren't afraid because they've had these ideas uh, that aren't necessarily true you can really find um those those beautiful stories of of resilience and and hope thank you for being one of those storytellers mr attorney general i'm going to give you the last word here and we're going to close out Thank you. I, I would like to ask everybody to read a book by Richard Rothstein. Richard Rothstein. It's called The Color of Law. And what he details in that book is that cities all over this country, including Minneapolis, had restrictive covenants on houses meaning that black people will never be allowed to own this home ever. And the Federal Housing Administration would not insure mortgages that did not include restrictive covenants. This phenomenon existed in law right up into the 60s. And then after that, the, we didn't pass fair housing until 1968. 68 is when we pass for housing. So when somebody doesn't own their own home and they legally cannot, then they they never build equity in their home. They're always a renter. Why did white America get into home ownership in a massive numbers, particularly post-war? Because the government subsidized it. But 100 years before that, why did white America get a farm in, in South Dakota? Why did a Norwegian immigrant get a farm in South Dakota? because the government had a land grant program. I know I'm pissing off people right now. You want to believe, I got this through hard work. You got that because Lincoln took those people's land and gave it to you. I'm sorry. I know I'm making y'all mad, but it's just true. Read it. This is why we're fighting over critical race theory right now, because some people don't want to accept that fact, but it's in the books. You can read it. I'm not making this stuff up. Read it. People were not allowed to own a home. I'm sure there's somebody who might think, well, you know, yeah, probably black people, they just, they need to get up their character, save their money, and then they can own a home. Just like my ancestors did. No, your ancestors were treated completely differently, and I'm not talking about slavery. And, and this is just true, you know? So we, so, okay, so then a few black folks get some homes after 68. Not a not lot, but some, but then, the federal government says, well, we're not going to enforce fair, you know, a mortgage uh, and credit discrimination laws. 
So up until 2008, 2008, within the memory of everybody in this room, it was extremely common for black people to be steered into high, into subprime mortgages, even if they're doctors and lawyers and got a lot of money. They're paying a higher interest rate and a higher risk loan. So when, you know, you got to pay the piper in, two, in 2008, who, who, had, who had $17 trillion in mortgage, in, 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 in accumulated mortgage wealth wiped out, black community? So <laughs> this was, uh, the government segregated our country. The government did. It was not some individual racist person. The government did it. My question is, what's the government's responsibility? Now, housing, where you live, is deter determines where you go to, which determines your quality of your education, which determines your employment prospects, which determines your health care access. Is there any reason? Is there any, does anybody doubt why we have what we have? It's the most obvious thing in the world. The only reason we don't know it is because, well, we got people working hard to make sure we don't know it. But read Richard Rothstein's book. It is absolutely an eye opener for those of you not familiar with this history. Richard Rothstein, the color of law. Appreciate that. Uh, the Attorney General mentioned earlier about the pardon board. One other thing for folks to be aware of, currently under Minnesota law, there's three ex officio members of the pardon board, the Attorney General, the Chief Judge of the Minnesota Supreme Court, and the Governor of Minnesota. I won't ask the Attorney General to comment on sort of the current litigation, whether it should be two or three of them, but um, I think it is important to, to, to note that, that issue. And one other thing, tying it back to your comment about housing, is that we had a pardon that was issued. It was the very first posthumous pardon in the state of Minnesota concerning Max Mason, who was accused of rape of Irene Tuscan back in 1919. And in that point in time in Duluth, three circus workers, Isaac McGee, Clayton Jackson, and um, Clayton, we were lynched by about 10,000 individuals within Duluth. Um, this is a story that needed to be told. Appreciate the chief judge from the Minnesota District Court, uh, members of the legal community, and our attorney general for amplifying that, that first posthumous pardon. So again, something uh, to, to read about and understand more about our history. Let me at this time ask you to help me thank the panel for the wonderful conversation that we had today with Mr. Hodges, <laughs> and attorney general Allison.